Hello, and welcome to another episode of Balanced Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have an absolutely incredible guest to reintroduce to you now. Ben Bickman, PhD, is a returning guest on our show. Be sure to check out his first appearance on Balanced Body Radio way back on episode 30, which is our most popular episode we've ever recorded on Apple Podcasts. Ben Bickman, PhD, a renowned metabolic research scientist based out of Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, is a popular speaker on human metabolism and nutrition. Backed by years of research, Dr. Bickman's mission is to help the world appreciate the prevalence and relevance of insulin resistance. His sensational book, Why We Get Sick, The Hidden Epidemic at the Root of Most Chronic Disease and How to Fight It, offers a thought-provoking yet real solution to insulin resistance and suggests how readers can reverse prediabetes, improve brain function, shed fat, and prevent diabetes. Dr. Bickman promotes prioritizing protein and healthy dietary fats and limiting our consumption of refined carbohydrates. In May of 2020, Dr. Bickman and his co-founding team of nutrition and industry experts launched the Health Code Complete Meal, a delicious shake for helping individuals maintain a healthy diet during a fast-paced lifestyle. Find Dr. Bickman on all social media at Ben Bickman PhD. Ben Bickman, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you back to Balanced Body Radio. Oh, my pleasure. Casey, thanks so much. We had such a good time the first time. Why not do it again? Why not do it again? We're up to about 600 episodes of the podcast. You came on on episode 30. You were one of the very first people. I never will forget the email that you wrote back to me and said, I'd love to be on your show. We had no listeners, nothing going on. You took the time to be on our show. Uh So meaningful. People like you and Bill Schindler I'll always thank. And it was just super meaningful before this chat to be able to thank you personally off air. And I want to just do it on air to thank you so very much for all of your work. The work you put out there was so instrumental in my career and to see, you know, the effects of it's not tons and tons of people, but the people that I get to work with and see on a day-to-day basis are my family. You know what I mean? And after giving bad advice for a lot of years to now feel like I'm making a difference in my small little corner of the world is, is really meaningful to me. And you're a big, big part of that. So I really appreciate it. Oh, that means a lot to me. Uh, really, one of the things that frustrates me as a scientist is the inability to take an idea that you believe has value and have it only live within the pages of a peer-reviewed manuscript in a science journal behind a paywall that no one will ever read. And so it's a very much been a concerted effort on my part to take these ideas that I consider valuable and, and share them, you know, get them from the lab, from academia and into the real world. Uh, so it's very gratifying. Uh, thanks for saying that. I'm very, very pleased to hear that some of these ideas have been so helpful. Absolutely. I know you must have hesitated when you first got onto social media and made your short videos that really help people. It's not your you know, idea to go out and be like self aggrandizing in any particular way, but you do it in a way that's very valuable and genuine. Everybody, I mean, everybody in this community loves you and loves the work that you do just for kicks and giggles. I decided to go back and search the transcripts we have from all of our shows. Um, I I get a certain amount of transcription done for free. And I just wanted to see, like, let me search Bickman's name with a CK and see how many times it pops up. (laughs) We've done 600 episodes. I have 200 transcripts. You were in over 25 of my transcripts mentioned by name by some of our guests. And that's incredible. That's amazing. Oh, I'm thrilled. That really is very touching to hear. Yeah. I mean, it's um, in a way, nothing sort of delights a professor more than when you see that your class is a little bigger than you thought it was. So the fact that I have unexpected students in unexpected places is pretty delightful. And I was just hoping that like if kids are in your class and they're, you know, at least playing on Instagram, hopefully they're at least following you. Maybe <laughs> if they're not paying to you, attention to you in person, they can at least learn from you while you're on Instagram. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So Casey's referring to for the audience. So you've heard me say this before, Casey. So my, my lecturing style is very unique um, and, and it's it's formed quite heavily because of the students where I learned very early in my career as a professor that I needed to create a lecturing style that could outcompete social media. And so to your joke, if so everyone follows, you know, I, I've, I've garnered a sufficient following on social media where even if they don't hear what I say in class, maybe they're getting some of what I'm saying on Instagram while I'm lecturing in class. There you go. Meet them where they are. Even I'll if take what I can get. There. Yeah. <laughs> 
I love it. Uh, you recently gave some presentations in Florida that I really want to talk about. Um, John Laspina, in particular, one of our recent guests, was so fired up about your talk. You, you said your, pre, your PowerPoint presentation was amazing. Um, I wasn't able to attend the conference. I would have gone had I known that Low Conference Denver wasn't going to be held this year. Heartbreaking. Um, but I was able to watch the presentation. It was really amazing. I love the slides. It was fantastic. Definitely want to talk about that today. Um, but I've been kind of reflecting. You told us your story of how you got interested in some of this stuff. And I, I wonder if somebody might hear about a scientist who was studying muscle mass and exercise science and all these things that sound like really fun and sexy and like mm -hmm. all this cool stuff. And then he got interested in fat. And fat isn't really all that sexy. It doesn't do anything. It's just inert. It gets in the body. We hate it anyway. But can you tell us a little bit of the story of why fat in particular is so absolutely fascinating? Yeah, yeah. So you really touched on really sort of the early part of my journey. Um, and let me just as a brief little tangent, which I'm always going on. So I, I, I should just stop clarifying them. Everyone expects me to go on a tangent. Um, my but if, if someone were listening who was in, at, at the beginning of their career, um, I would want them to hear this because it was such a, a, a time of my life as a newlywed and a, a young married man, a new husband who was trying to establish a, a career path that would allow me to be a provider and a protector for my family. It was a, it was an unexpectedly crushing weight that fell on my shoulders. Uh, unexpected because I just really did not anticipate what it would feel like to someday anticipate needing to really have a, a meaningful career that I would enjoy, that would allow me flexibility to be with my family and to provide for my family, most importantly. Um, and so this, this, all of this sort of story, it was happening with that backdrop where I really didn't know what I was going to do with my life. And just again, to finish the tangent, it really was the clearest impression I've ever received to this day. Uh, in my entire life, uh, and that was 25 years ago now, um, the clearest impression was to follow this path that I'm still on. And I, I just, I thank God for it uh, every day. Uh, now, at the time, um, shortly after this path had been sort of made known to me, or just this, this path sort of cleared itself in my mind, I had intended to go into to continue to pursue muscle physiology and muscle cell biology because of my background in exercise science. I was very interested in muscle adaptation, like a lot of young men are who work out. You know, I wasn't that unique. Um, but then I stumbled on a paper that explained how fat cells start to really behave differently depending on their size. And fat is unique in a lot of ways. One of the reasons it's unique is that there's no tissue in the body that is capable of growing to the same degree that the fat cells are capable of growing. A fat cell can grow to more than 10 or 20 times its initial size. There is nothing like it in the body. And then as it grows beyond the difference in its size is a very different, a very stark shift in its function. In a small state, a fat cell really contributes to an overall very healthy metabolic milieu within the body. It improves insulin sensitivity, and anyone can go back and listen to our first discussion to get more on that. It improves inflammation. It improves the um, production of sex hormones even. But then all of this immediately flips around as the fat cell gets ever larger. Now it's pro-inflammatory. Now it's disrupting other hormone function. It's promoting insulin resistance. But it was the inflammation part, back to sort of finish this answer back to your question, it was the inflammation that interested me the most because um, in the early 2000s, late 90s, when, I, when this paper was published, it, it detailed this series of events whereby fat mass, as the body's getting fatter, it led to type 2 diabetes. And the, the, the bridge that connected it was insulin resistance, but what built the bridge was inflammation. And that became the work of my PhD studies and my postdoctoral fellowship. And even still to this day, I still, of course, focus on insulin resistance. I very much continue to focus on fat cell biology and um, inflammation as well, uh, where we have some papers just in the pipeline coming out soon, further detailing how inflammation contributes to insulin resistance. 
interesting. Well, your book is all about insulin resistance. It's actually absolutely wonderful. I absolutely love it. I told you last time, I tell you again, it's a very shareable book. It's a good resource that I can give to people and know that they will understand. And it's called Why We Get Sick. And you've been talking recently more about how we get fat, which I think is an interesting question. And you, you kind of go through this in your presentation where you're talking about different fat cells, not only multiplying, but also like you're just describing getting bigger. Can you talk about those two things, if that's a good entry point into this conversation? Oh, yeah, it sure is. Yeah, I very much have, when it comes to insulin resistance, and, and the reason we talk about this, of course, is because it is the most prevalent disorder on the planet. I've given versions of talks about insulin resistance in dozens of countries around the world, um, from the Middle East to Southeast Asia to North Asia. Um, this this is a problem, Europe, um, this is a problem that is almost infecting the entire world. It is so it is the single most common problem, again, just to really make that clear. And so that's why I feel very justified in focusing on this as a career. It is so meaningful. I very much have a fat first focus when it comes to insulin resistance, that it's the fat cells. Now, insulin resistance is, while it is one single problem, you can get to it from multiple ways. Um, that's that's a little frustrating, is that there are multiple noxious stimuli that can get a body to insulin resistance. But if I were to sum up the most common and gradual progression of the average individual, it's going to be the fat cells that fall first. It's like the stack of dominoes, and each domino is a different tissue of the body. It's the fat cell that is the first domino, and then it starts bumping into the liver and muscle and the pancreas uh, and, and uh, you know other cells of the pancreas. So it starts to spread and, and amplify in a way, but the fat tissue is the first one to become insulin resistant. And it's all about how fat cells grow. And I'm stating that very um, precisely because it's not necessarily, that is not the same as how much fat a body has. Or to say that all another way, it's not a matter of fat mass. It's a matter of the size of each individual fat cell that determines whether this body is getting ever more into insulin resistance and inflammation or whether it is staying healthy, insulin sensitive and metabolically sound. Now, as you alluded to, someone you could have two different people who have gained the exact same amount of fat. Let's say they've each gained 10 pounds of fat. But they can have gained that fat through two totally different mechanisms. One of the things, again, that is unique about fat is not only its ability to grow each cell substantially, but also to multiply in some instances and in some people. Now, the, that, and these are two different processes, respectively called hypertrophy, when the size of each cell is changing, their volume, it's like you're blowing up, up a balloon, or opposed to hyperplasia which is when the size of the fat cell is normal, but they're multiplying, they're proliferating. So we're, we're not blowing up the balloon, we're just getting more balloons in the pile here. And so there's relatively more we're holding on to. But again, it's whether the size of the balloons have changed, but the, the number hasn't, that's hypertrophy, or whether the number has changed, but the size really hasn't, that's hyperplasia. Now, as I already alluded to, it really is a matter of size. And, and now that is largely genetic, but also influenced through diet um, to a lesser degree. But some people have the genetic potential just to continue to make more and more fat cells. These are the people who can continue to get fat. They just keep getting fatter. These are the people who get to 500 or 600 pounds. The average person could never get that fat. Casey, you and I could do our darndest. We would never get that big. Maybe we'd get to the upper 200s, maybe, maybe 300. For me, that would be impossible. Maybe I could get, I would say at the most, I could get to the mid 200s. I simply could not get any further than that. Um, and that's because my body doesn't make limitless new fat cells as most people's body don't. And so there ends up being this kind of threshold because your fat cell number isn't changing. It really is a matter of how full can your fat cells get. Now, a cell can only get so big, just like a balloon can only be filled with so much water. If it continues to force more fluid in or fat in, in the case of the fat cell, it would burst. The same thing would happen with a fat cell. So the fat cell that's undergone such substantial hypertrophy begins to resist the signal telling it to continue to grow. 
that signal is insulin. There's no other signal that's telling the fat cell to grow like insulin is. And so as the fat cell is reaching a point of maximum dimension, it begins to tell insulin, insulin, you want me to keep growing, but I can't. So I'm becoming resistant to you. I'm not listening to you anymore. So that's the insulin resistance component. But at the same time, fat cells, every cell in the body must be within just a few micrometers of a capillary or blood vessels in order to get oxygen and to give up its CO2 and to get, metab to get nutrients and to give off its waste metabolites. So it needs to be within a few microns or a few micrometers. Unfortunately, with hypertrophy, a fat cell can get to several times that same distance. And so the fat cells start to push each other further and further away from capillaries and thus begin to suffocate, which is a process or a term called hypoxia. Now, one way to correct the hypoxia is for the fat cell to begin secreting pro-inflammatory hormones or proteins called cytokines. And they do in fact activate inflammation in the body. But one consequence of the inflammation is the growth of new blood vessels. So the fat cell is secreting all of these pro-inflammatory proteins in order to induce the production of new blood vessels in an effort to try to correct its hypoxia. Now, it does improve the ability of the fat cell to survive, but then the rest of the body is paying the consequence for this. The fat, these two things, becoming insulin resistant and becoming pro-inflammatory, that the fat cell is doing in order to ensure its own survival become two very relevant things when we look at the consequences throughout the body. So the rest of the body is suffering all in order for the fat cell to continue to survive. And, and, and as I mentioned, it's very much genetic. And our genes, of course, um, determine our sex. And so it's no surprise that there's some sex-specific phenomena here as well, namely that women have a higher capacity for hyperplasia than men. And so it's no surprise knowing that, that women will naturally have more fat than men, but be healthier um, while they have more of those fat cells. And that's entirely a function of sex hormones like estradiol and even progesterone contributes to that. But it's also then no surprise that as the woman goes through menopause, she now begins to suffer the consequences of that fat. So I kind of joke, although a menopausal woman wouldn't appreciate it, that <laughs> once the woman goes through menopause, she sort of loses her metabolic superpowers that prior to that, <clears throat> prior to menopause, She's kind of invulnerable to to these meta, to, to real substantial metabolic problems. Now, that's not to say a woman can't have metabolic problems, um, but it will be much less than it is in her male counterpart. But once she goes through menopause, then she's just as she's mortal now, just like her male counterpart has always been, and she'll start to suffer the consequences of that fat mess, um, just like he does. But anyway, all of this is my long-winded way of saying we can grow fat through two different ways. Um, and one is healthier than the other, namely hyperplasia offering more metabolic benefit than hypertrophy. But unfortunately, most people who gain weight, and I mean most people, it's about 88% of all people, they gain it through hypertrophy if they're gaining fat mass. Interesting. Okay. Well, I had a client today ask me to ask you about that exact situation of a woman going through menopause and noticing those types of differences in the fat gain and how that changes. Is it fair to say with the hormonal changes, it's almost as if their body is acting not like a male's, but more closely tied to a male, more on like a, a 24 hour kind of daily cycle versus like a 28 day cycle? Oh yeah. For, yeah. That's a, that's a perfect way of describing it. I mean, once, because she's lost these much, much higher levels of estradiol and progesterone, um, not that her sex hormones go exactly to the level that a male's is, that's, that doesn't happen, but it still gets into that range and it's sex hormones that do have an influence on how we store fat. It's insulin that determines how much fat we store, but then it's sex hormones that determine how we store it. Yeah. Very interesting. So I, I guess I got some clients that are like this. Some people, my clients have, have a tough time losing fat and they can get very big, but besides that, they don't seem to be hardly unhealthy at all. They, they seem just fine. When they get labs, they look pretty darn good to me yep. and I, I can't, really identify like a health issue per se. They just can add fat very easily. Maybe along the lines of what Gary Taubes says, like those of us who fatten easily. Um, and, and I noticed other people from other cultures, especially like we mentioned Asian descendants or whatever, it seems like they, they don't get that same level of obesity, but they can get very, very diabetic. Is that? Oh kind yeah. Of 
Yeah, yeah, you've totally, that, you absolutely nailed it. Yeah, I mean, this my emphasis on genetics is very, very informed by my experience in Southeast Asia. When I did my postdoctoral work in Singapore, one of the reasons the government of Singapore was so eager to collaborate with Duke University and create an institute, if you will, to focus on metabolic health was because of the profound ethnic disparity that they were seeing there, where across Singapore, there are four dominant ethnicities, Chinese Asian, Malaysian, um, South Asian or Indian, and then Caucasian European. And you would see this massive disparity, as I said, where you'd have a group of Caucasians who were obese and perfectly healthy, relatively speaking. And then you'd have a group on the far end of the spectrum of Chinese Singaporean men, um, and they were just moderately chubby, just a little overweight, and they were already hypertensive, pre-diabetic, um, fatty liver disease, and that is absolutely a function of look at the size of their fat cell, not the mass of fat on their body, and on average, accounting for you know randomness, but on average, an Asian body type will have a much, much lower capacity to create new fat cells, and thus, even at their fattest, a typical Asian would be only modestly chubby compared to by by a Caucasian standard. So you have this big spectrum where on one end you have Caucasian Northern Europeans who appear to be able to get the fattest with the least consequences. Then you have blacks that are kind of around there. And then you get to the middle where it's Hispanics and you keep going to South Asian and then Asian um, having the lowest tolerance um, for for fat storage on the body. Yeah, fascinating. Is, is it important for any of us to know outside of our, our born race, like what category we fit into? Like, is there any kind of like a test or anything to show? Or are we more just concerned about the insulin resistance and everything that comes after that? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, I think it would be best served. I mean, there are some precise tests that you can do in a lab setting, but not in a clinic setting. Like we're about to publish a paper where we were documenting a change in fat cell size based on the expression of hormones from from the fat cells you can't do that in a clinical setting they don't they won't measure those hormones for you they don't have the ability to so yeah i do think to get a functional to, to have a functional appreciation of your fat mass is more important than actually trying to determine the size of your fat cells and that would be what is your fasting insulin what is your triglyceride to hdl ratio and and if those numbers are good then you have small fat cells. Now you may have more fat cells than you want. You know, the person may be saying, well, that's great. You know, Casey, thanks. My insulin is three and my triglyceride to HDL ratio is 0 0.8. Those are perfect numbers, but I still have 50 pounds I want to lose. Um, I mean, that's a different matter, um, but it's still, even still the interventions to shrink fat cells um, are going to be the process. And that's something we can get into. Yeah, very interesting. And those markers are your favorite. Triglyceride to HDL as a proxy can pretty darn well tell you what's going on. Yep. Yep. Very much yeah. so. Yeah. So that's a really good one because um, it's not very common that people are getting their insulin measured. It's just a little more difficult to measure that. But everyone always gets their lipids measured. Always. We always will get cholesterol numbers and triglyceride. So take the HDL cholesterol or sorry, triglycerides and divide it by HDL. And if that number is less than 1.5 and generally the lower, the better, then that's a very good sign that you're insulin sensitive. Got it. Okay. Excellent. We, we mentioned it a bunch. You've already explained it to some level, but it would be a shame to bring you on the show to not get your take of what exactly is insulin resistance. Um, we've had it explained probably a hundred times. And the thing I appreciate the most is how everybody just has a slight nuance and explains it just slightly different. So if this is a good point in the story, um, maybe we could have you in, in the most Ben Bickman way explain what is insulin resistance. Yeah. In fact, if I'm going to speak with any authority, let it be what I'm about to say. So <laughs> anyone whose definition of insulin resistance differs from mine is wrong. This is the one thing I, I will be a little um, bold with. Um, so insulin resistance is a pathology with two parts. It's a coin with two sides. You cannot have one without the other. It does not work um, in all but the most acute setting. You know, if we're talking about path uh, really developing and progressing insulin resistance, it will always have these two parts. The first is the insulin resistance part itself, which is when the hormone insulin isn't signaling or isn't getting the response throughout the body that it used to. That is when the cells, some cells, not all, but some cells in some tissues have become insulin resistant. 
So that's the first part of insulin resistance. But then the second part is very relevant too, which is if we flip this coin over, it is that blood insulin levels are elevated. There is no insulin resistance without elevated blood insulin, a condition called hyperinsulinemia. There is actually one instance, which is true starvation, which is not the same as fasting, but that is so uncommon as to just not really need to be discussed. But in that case, it would be insulin resistance with low insulin, but the conventional insulin resistance, even the insulin resistance of puberty, the insulin resistance of pregnancy, which are states of physiological insulin resistance, it still meets those same two definitions. Now, of course, what I focus on mostly as a um, scientist and what we've been discussing is the pathological insulin resistance or the form of this that's contributing to diseases. It is still both of those variables. Insulin isn't working the right way at all of the cells of the body, and two, blood insulin levels are elevated. But number two, that second point matters. It's so important when we remember or hear what I'm not saying, which is that some of the body's cells and some of the body's tissues are still responding to insulin perfectly well. They're as sensitive as they ever were. But now they're getting overstimulated because of the hyperinsulinemia. The elevated insulin is now doing too much at those cells that are hearing everything too well. And then, of course, it's still not working particularly well at the cells that have become insulin resistant. And we see this perfectly encapsulated, these two aspects of insulin resistance in the two most common forms of infertility. In women, it's polycystic ovary syndrome, which is a disorder of the elevated insulin part of insulin resistance, where the high insulin is inhibiting her ovaries' ability to create estradiol. And so it ends up creating just a bunch of testosterone by default. But on the other hand, in men, the most common form of infertility is erectile dysfunction. And that's a consequence of the insulin resistance of the blood cells, of the blood vessel cells, rather, the endothelium or the lining of the blood vessels, which are reliant on insulin in part to activate this process of vasodilation or expanding the blood flow to enable, in this case, normal erectile function. So we see that as I said, encapsulated very well within the two most common forms of infertility, the ultimate definition of insulin resistance being a pathology of two parts, one, the insulin resistance, and two, the hyperinsulinemia. We will take that as the standard explanation yeah. for insulin resistance. You heard it here first from yeah. Dr. Ben Bickman. He may have lost some clout on our last episode by saying that frosted mini wheats were like the best cereal. <laughs> that is objectively, scientifically not true, according to a study I just made up. But um, yeah, that was a great explanation. And and so you you alluded to you know sexual function as as an example um and and fertility issues but what are some of the other issues that people should just always be thinking of when they hear insulin resistance next steps associated diseases you do such a good job with this in your book but just as a as a flyby of some of the things that people should be pretty darn nervous about yeah yeah um the some of the lowest hanging fruit which is to say the most obvious signs and symptoms of insulin resistance that people can look for one is just blood pressure if a person has ongoing hypertension day after day, regardless of how they sleep, because sleep is a huge contributor um, to, to high blood pressure. So if someone sleeps well and they're still hypertensive the next day, you really should assume you're insulin resistant or get that checked. Second is to look at the skin. The skin is a window to the metabolic soul, particularly around the neck. And so look at or feel the neck. And if a person feels that they have kind of tissue papery crinkled neck uh, skin, the skin around their neck, and if they can see it, if it's darker pigmented, that's easier to see on fairer complected or lighter complected people. Um, but that's a condition called acanthosis nigricans, where the melanin, it gets darker. Now, just as a point of interest, um, people will refer to some different ethnicities as melanated or not. As The fact of the matter is every body has melanin. It's just different colors of melanin. So it's not a, like there's there are races or ethnicities with different amounts of melanin. That's not true. It's just different colors of melanin, just so that we're clear and how bigoted we want to be when we speak about different races. Um, <laughs> but anyway... So the melanin will just be a darker melanin. So it'll be a darker, but a tissue papery feeling skin around the neck. But at the same time, they may also have a second skin problem um, called skin tags as a kind of colloquial word or term for it. But that's almost like little mushrooms of skin. It's not like a big lump, like a mole. It's rather like a little column of skin sticking up. And people know what I'm talking about. We've all seen them. 
Both of those are very much signs of insulin resistance, and they are very reversible as insulin sensitivity improves. Interesting. Okay, going back to your talk, you show different situations of what might happen with you know, changing either energy coming in, insulin itself, how that dictates where fat is going. We could probably tie this into metabolic rate and calorie burning and the idea that is very much promoted in, in my industry in particular, that you need to, to, to maintain caloric you know, control and to lose weight, to gain weight, whatever, you need to lose weight in particular. You need to eat less and you need to move more is the thing that everybody's told. Um, yeah. Is this a good part of the conversation to pull that in? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, particularly in light of the definition we just gave about fat mass and it's relevant and it's relevant specifically it's the size of the fat cell that matters most and so thus if it's the size that matters most it's the size that we should focus on so how can you shrink fat cells and that becomes relevant for both hypertrophy and hyperplasia if there are people who have hyperplastic fat growth and have a much easier time getting fat um, it still is a matter of shrinking the fat cells it is not a matter of losing the fat cells and that's an important distinction. The fat cells are very, very long lived. They're not immortal, but they're very long lived. And so if someone's losing weight, it's not because their fat cells are going away. It's just that they're shrinking them so considerably. So that is the matter at hand. How do we shrink fat cells? And there are two, um, there are two steps a person can take. And I like to use this analogy where we think of it like a, a, a journey. And it, it is a fat cell shrinking journey. And we are at the beginning of this journey, we who want to shrink our fat cells. We have two feet. We have two steps we can take. One step is going to be an energy step or a calorie, low calorie. And the other step is going to be a low insulin step because those are the two variables that influence the growth of fat cells. You must have a stimulus telling the fat cell to grow, which is insulin, and you must have sufficient energy to fuel that growth, which is calories. You cannot have fat cell growth in one without the other. It is incompatible. It doesn't work. But just to really put a fine point on that, as you noted, within the realm of understanding obesity and why we get fat, we have unfortunately created a culture, you and I are fighting it, Casey and I specifically, where it is purely focused on calories. It is purely a matter. It has become purely a matter of thermodynamics, which is ridiculous. Uh, I just case in point, I have fat cells that are growing in my lab across the hallway right here in this building, fat cells growing in a little Petri dish in, in an incubator. We have within this little Petri dish, the cells are growing in a soupy little broth that we call a culture medium. And within that medium are all kinds of calories. There's glucose and fats that this, that this, these fat cells could take up and use, but they don't. They stay skinny little small fat cells, even though they are swimming in a little sea of, of calories. They don't take them up because there's no insulin in the culture. The moment we spike in insulin, we can check it 12 hours later and they're big and fat and juicy. Now they know what to do with the energy that they have. This is perhaps no more evident than in a type one diabetic. A type one diabetic can totally control how much insulin is in their bodies. If they decided to go and eat an entire chocolate cake, they would not gain a single scrap of fat on their body if they simply underdosed or didn't inject their insulin entirely. And indeed, that is so tempting to some type 1 diabetics that they do it. They, they take advantage of this fact and deliberately underdose their insulin, creating a problem called diabulimia which is basically an eating disorder um, that is driven by the person simply failing to inject sufficient insulin. They are eating thousands of calories a day and they are as skinny as they want. I mean, imagine the temptation, everyone listening. All they got to do is not poke themselves with a needle and then they can be as skinny as they want. So don't ever think that fat cell growth is a matter of energy alone. Now, energy matters. You cannot stimulate, you cannot signal a fat cell to grow in the absence of energy to fuel that growth. So insulin's telling the fat cell to get big. The calories are giving the building blocks for it to actually build itself bigger. Now, those are the two variables that promote the growth of fat. Those are thus the two variables that we leverage to shrink the fat cells. Now, back to this analogy of the journey. We're on a fat cell shrinking journey. Most people start with the first step being low calorie. They just jump right in. They're cutting calories, which means inevitably, invariably, they're cutting fat. 
because cat fat has more calories and that means they're and they end up eating more carbohydrate well carbohydrate stimulates insulin and we know from well controlled studies that if you give people two different types of meals but they're exactly matched in calories they are isocaloric if the meal spikes insulin because it's higher carb but lower fat they will be hungrier much sooner <coughs> And this is what we see here. This is the reason why so many people are so doomed to fail. If they start their weight loss journey with low energy being the first step, but they haven't addressed their high insulin, the total amount of energy in the blood goes down because insulin's pushing it into blood into the cells of the body because insulin wants to store the energy. And this becomes a problem for the brain who can't store energy. The brain needs to be getting energy from the blood constantly. And if there's not enough energy coming into the blood from the diet, and there's a lot of energy going out because of the high insulin, which hasn't really been addressed yet, it's no surprise that the person gets hungry and hunger always wins. This is why, Casey, we will never see a reunion tour of the game show, the TV show, The Biggest Loser. You will never see these people again because they gain it all back and then some. They go back, they materially surpass where they started. Because the, the whole time under these rigid, strict conditions where they are being starved and exercised, not to death, but I'm sure it feels like it to them, they will lose substantial weight. But they've not really addressed the insulin. Their body is, the brain is starving. It is hungry. Hunger always wins. So if the first step is a low energy step, hunger will win. And they'll find themselves right back at that beginning line before they know it. So... Let's take the other step first, which is the low insulin step, because it need not be based on low energy, promoting hunger. You can tell the person, eat when you're hungry. If you're not eat, don't, if you're not hungry, rather, don't eat. So let hunger dictate when you're eating or not. But when you do eat, follow three basic rules, and you alluded to them at the beginning of our discussion. Control carbohydrates which is don't get your carbs from bags and boxes with barcodes, have whole fruits and vegetables, don't drink them. That's basically the gist of the control carbs angle. Two, prioritize protein, focus on high quality animal sourced protein, especially. And then three, don't fear the fat that comes with that protein. There is no protein that exists in nature without coming, without being coupled to fat. It does not exist. In our fear of fat and perhaps in our hubris, we have split them apart but we've not done ourselves any favors. We do not absorb and digest, or the other way around, we do not digest and absorb protein as well if we get it alone. We want to get protein with fat. That is how it comes in nature. That's how we've been designed to eat it. So the third and final point, again, being don't fear fat. So those rules, control carbs, prioritize protein, don't fear fat, will help someone address the low insulin step because it's carbs that spike insulin the most with protein and fat having little or no effect. So yeah. in that case, by lowering insulin, they are starting to mobilize their own energy. They're increasing their metabolic rate. They're making ketones, which are wasted calories that come out of the body. So they're, they're really just wasting energy if insulin's low, because if insulin's low, the body cannot hold on to it. And then they will lose weight. They will take several steps or hopping on that one foot of low insulin down the path to the insulin, to the smaller fat cells. And then they may get to the point where they say, but I want to go a little further. Now you can take the low calorie step or the lower energy step, but not because you are counting calories or you are avoiding fat. You do it because you are now, you have frequent fasting. You have structured fasts that you've worked in. When it's time to eat, you eat, but you still follow those same three rules that you followed before. But now you have structured fasts and that will lend itself to beginning to restrict energy in a bit more of a natural state without feeling like you're depriving yourself. But as I invoke fasting as that kind of last principle, the fourth and final part of this, let me just say how you end your fast matters more than how long you fast. When we think about fasting, we think about the, the window, the timeline. I'm doing a 24-hour fast, and we don't really necessarily plan for how it's going to end. How you end matters more than how long you've done it. So plan carefully, have a set meal ready to go. Don't do everything you can to avoid binging and then setting yourself up on the cycle of overeating, feeling miserable, feeling ashamed, resolving to do better the next day and you do it again and again and again.
fascinating explanation. As a matter of anecdote, we talked about this briefly last time, but I spent over a decade on a metabolic cart training people at my club. I trained people in, in the entire region of my company, the trainers, how to do metabolic testing to determine resting metabolic rate, metabolic rate during exercise, VO2, max, all that stuff. And I had the opportunity, this is probably 15 years ago, of testing somebody who had just gotten booted off of The Biggest Loser. She came in to do the test before she left. I want to recall that her resting metabolic rate, she's a big person, obviously, most of them were. Um, her resting metabolic rate was pretty darn close to what the um, Harris-Benedict equation yep. was. I know you talk a lot about um, yep. Mr. Benedict. Um, sure do. Yeah. Anyway, it was pretty close to somewhere around like 1800 calories, 2000 calories. By the time she came back and got tested again, we measured her at around a thousand calories. So it is severely, severely. Diminished you know what? That, the reason rate. that is so compelling is that that perfectly jives with data published by the NIH. There was this scientist, this group who looked at these people and measured their metabolic rate before and after. And just like you said, their metabolic rate was down. It's actually a scientist that I have trouble respecting entirely, but his name's Kevin Hall. Yeah. Um, he published this paper. Um, I don't remember the title of it, but it had the term biggest loser in the title of, but that's what he found. They found that post game show, post TV show, their metabolic rate no longer matched body mass. Normally metabolic rate is coupled to body mass. The body mass goes up, metabolic rate goes up, body mass goes down, metabolic rate goes down. And what they found was that as metabolic, as body mass went back up to where it was, metabolic rate didn't. It didn't go up like it was like it should have, given that metabolic rates usually determined by fat mass or, or by by body mass, and so it's a it was a very overall um, deleterious um, adaptation to what I consider to be the most horrific way to try to lose weight, namely solely based on eat less, exercise more. I mean, but Casey, we intuitively know that's bad. Like everyone listening, if if Casey and I were hosting a dinner and we said, we are having the best chefs in the world come and prepare the most delicious food in the world, we want everyone listening to come and come hungry because you're going to want to try a little bit of everything or more than a little bit of everything. So you take the invitation, you accept it. What would you do to come as hungry as possible? Everyone would probably do two things. In the days before the dinner, you would eat a little less and you would exercise a little harder just going a little more, and sure enough, it would work perfectly. You would come to our beautiful buffet as hungry as possible by eating less and exercising more. And now you see the problem. That is the two-pronged advice that well-meaning but ignorant people have been giving for 50 or 60 years, and it's no surprise that it hasn't worked because all we're actually doing, rather than giving them a recipe for shrinking their fat cells, we're giving them a recipe to make them as hungry as possible. Hunger always wins. Yep. And this is the reason why gym goers and gym lovers like you and I are starting to appreciate this time of year, mid-February, when the gym is starting to get a little bit less crowded because that's exactly what happens. People are motivated. They want to do good this year. They didn't do that great last year. Want to do great. So let's start exercising. Let's start eating less. That works for a little while. You lose some weight and then less and less and less and less and it plateaus. And now you are a cold and hungry and and very much having cravings type of a person yeah, and depressed, you miserable. Out. Yes. Yeah. Oh. I mean, we can keep going. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's awful. And people don't know that. So I'm glad we highlighted that. We learned by using these metabolic carts that if we manipulated the diet for people, the content of the diet, that we could change what we call the respiratory quotient or the difference between the oxygen and carbon dioxide out that determines whether fat burning is occurring or carbohydrate burning is occurring. So that was really helpful in my career to notice like, oh, we can help endurance athletes do marathons and long cycling rides and they can feed themselves with fat and actually get through the event without bonking. That was a revelation, which is great. I told you on the last episode, when people started doing that, they started doing more of the low carbohydrate type approach. We would also see a slight elevation in metabolic rate. And we both know that scientifically that has been proven. But the thing that broke my brain that I really needed to find you and Dr. Jason Fung to understand is when fasting became more of a thing, when it was paired with consuming lots of fat and protein, really restricting carbohydrate, and then fasting, that's when I would see metabolic rates go bananas. I'm, I'm talking like 500, 600, 700 calories above the expected value that you would expect to see on somebody based on their age, height, weight, and gender. And I couldn't figure it out because on the one hand, you have these people who are restricting calories and they're dropping their metabolic rate. On the other hand, these people are not consuming a lot of calories, but the opposite thing is happening. And it's exactly what you said. Fasting is not restriction. If you fill yourself 
with food that makes you very satiated, makes the fasting become really easy, you are unlocking fat cells and now your body is feeding off of the fat cells for its energy. You don't need to eat as much. Yep. Amen. Yep. Hearty amen. I have nothing to add to that. That's brilliant. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. I think I, I lament this all the time. One of my favorite studies, and I think one of yours as well, was, was a series of studies done by uh, George Cahill in the 60s. And one in particular where he starved people for 40 days, which could never be done. But if that one study, if that one graph from that one study made it into my nutrition coaching manual, that tells you everything about human nutrition that you need to know. It's fascinating. Oh, Cahill's a legend. Uh, good for you for in, for mentioning him. There are these physiologists um, like Cahill who are just legends. You've mentioned um, Benedict, Elliot Joslin. There are so many incredible scientists who made so many wonderful discoveries. And that's part of what I love. I love bringing to light some of the science of the past because not always am I showing data from my own lab. Just as often when I'm giving these talks, I'm sharing data from scientists that are long past who made these really meaningful contributions that maybe even at the time weren't appreciated, but now it, it is time to appreciate them as we're facing a metabolic storm like we've really never faced before. The problem continues to get worse. COVID um, exagger uh, exacerbated it, amplified it, um, where we have obesity rates happening in kids now at younger ages. All I mean, COVID, I have strong feelings about this, so I won't get into it too deeply, but suffice it to say, um, we are not, uh, we've not turned a corner here. Metabolic health continues to get worse and thus the solutions continue to be more important. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit also about carbohydrate intake and the amount, I don't know if I'm asking this in the right way, but the amount of carbohydrate that is required to trigger an, an insulin response strong enough to shut down fat burning. Oh. I wonder I, I just I wonder about this all the time. Like if somebody is eating a mixed meal and they say, "Yeah, I had my fat, I had my protein, I focused on that, but I also had say a cup of rice or a half a cup of rice." Or what, what, do we know much about like how much carbohydrate we we need to trigger that in, that very strong insulin response? Yeah, that's a great question. So once again, we could go back to George Cahill, and he kind of put the number. Although this very much depends on the person. He sort of had a number around the low teens where he suggested that that really represented the metabolic um, tipping point, that if insulin was below the low teens, it would be more catabolic. In other words, fat burning. If insulin was higher than the mid-teens, then it was more lipogenic or fat storing. So the, the anabolic part of the fat story. So that's metabolism. Of course, metabolism is the sum of catabolism, the breaking down and anabolism or the building up. And so he suggested it was in the low teens where insulin is. Now, then that takes us back to the question of how much carb. Unfortunately, I can't answer it because it depends on the person. People who are very um, insulin sensitive and very athletic, they can eat they can eat well over 100 grams of carbs in a day, 150 grams, and still be ketogenic um, because they're burning, because it's all a matter of insulin. They just clear that glucose so quickly because they have big hungry muscles and they're so insulin sensitive. They eat that carb load. Insulin has gone up and down and it's back to normal in an hour, um, which, which is exceptional. Or you have someone who eats 50 grams of carb and because their insulin responses are so big, and it takes it four or five hours to come. Even in a normal insulin sensitive person, insulin will take a good two to three hours to come back down. And during that entire time, fat burning stops. And so if you take someone who's insulin resistant, now that insulin can stay elevated for five hours. And because we live in a culture of eating six times a day or even more, they're spending every waking moment in a state of elevated insulin. No surprise they can't lose weight. No surprise they're insulin resistant because too much insulin is a contributor to insulin resistance. So, the, so Casey, unfortunately, I can't really give a, a definite answer there because it really depends on the insulin sensitivity of the person, which is largely a function of their muscle mass and then mixed in with a little bit of genetics. But the more muscled and more active someone is, the more they can really push that number up and still stay in a fat burning mode. And, and if, if we're invoking ketosis at all or ketones, let's just only invoke them to the point of fat burning. Ketones are simply a sign of fat burning. That, that's all we need think of them. And it's true. There's a little more nuance to it, but that, nothing I said is wrong. 
that if someone is measuring their ketones, all you're doing is determining a degree of fat burning. And because that ketones are made from, they're a product of, of burning fat. And so if a person is very active, I mean, that might be a value where someone gets a ketone monitor and measures every morning or sometime of the day. That's a nice way to gauge whether their carb load, whatever amount it may be in a given day, is stopping fat burning or not. Yeah, that's a good point. I appreciate that explanation. I think another thing to consider here is is how what what is that carbohydrate intake then causing down the road? I think unfortunately for you and I, we're both very jealous of people like your wife. I've heard you describe this before, where she can have a bite of ice cream, yep, and have a bite of ice cream and be done. Like that's it. You and I, I if I have a bite of ice cream, I'm taking down the pint. Yep. And and I've heard you say like I'll start looking at hers. I'm yep. gonna take her ice cream every and time. It, it sucks. And I I want to say like I I love fruit. I don't think fruit is unhealthy at all. But I know for me personally, if I eat fruit, it's not the fruit that's the problem. It's the 20 minutes later when I'm starving and I don't want fruit anymore. I want pie. I want yep. apple pie. Yeah, you want to kick it up a notch. Oh, no, I get it. So I cannot say that that's a function of an insulin response. Um, I think it's more a function of um, uh, our personalities. Um, now, there is, in fact, a physiological response. A greater insulin response will promote a greater subsequent hunger. I alluded to some of those studies, and there are more. Um, there are there are abundant studies out there. But it's also it's it's complicated by personalities, where some people have an addictive personality. You and I, and and that's not always a bad thing, because it also means we're probably very tenacious. Um, Hopefully, I, mean, I think that's the case for both you and I, whether that's the case for everyone who has an addictive personality. Um, I find that I am a pit bull. If I'm pursuing something, I am pursuing it. And I just bring, which is wonderful in some ways. But when it comes to a pint of ice cream, I, I would have, I could have been content. Well, that's the problem. I'm not. Um, I should have been content at 20 bites, maybe a, a third of the way through. And just like you said, I, I cannot stop. I, I have to get to the bottom of that pint. I, I will have a bowl of cereal and then I will look at all the remaining milk and think, oh, I would be ashamed to waste this milk. I should put a little more cereal in there, you know, and fill it up again. And then, oh, I, I need to, then I eat some of that and I need a little more milk and then I need a little more cereal. You know, it's like, this, it never stops. But, but Cheryl, my wife, it's just, she's not the same way. Um, and, and I look at that and, and do not, I don't believe she's having a smaller insulin spike than I am. I'm bigger. I'm more muscled than her. I have no family history of type 2 diabetes like she does. In fact, I'm quite confident my metabolic response to that load is much better than hers. And yet I'm the one who can't stop. And that's why I think it's proper to invoke not only a physiological response in some instances, but very much a psychological. So for guys like you and I, it really is St. Augustine's encouragement um, of of moderation is easier than, or, or abstinence rather, is easier than perfect moderation. If I look at that ice cream, if I, last night we were at a Chinese New Year party um, with some friends from, from Singapore, and I looked at all the delicious little treats and candies and thought, it'll be better for me not to even have one. Because if I have one, I will keep going, I will keep going, I will keep going, and I don't like how I will feel, so it's easier so that's that's what he meant, St. Augustine, when he said perfect uh, or abstinence is easier than perfect moderation. And that is so important for people to hear because we have this seductive uh, sentiment of everything in moderation. And I don't know where that comes from. Um, I don't know what the origin of that term is, but boy, it is dangerous because it completely ignores the reality that so many people, including you and I, face and many other people, which is, I can't moderate. We're denying that reality of, of human behavior. Now, some people can. My wife can. I cannot. And so just while moderation in all things works for my wife, it doesn't. I am all in or I'm out. I don't do things in moderation. It doesn't work for me. It's not my personality. I'm, I'm very, I have a very addictive bend. And so it's easier if I never start. And so moderation doesn't work. Tell that to the alcoholic. Tell that to the carb addict, which is a very real eating disorder to be addicted to carbs that doesn't work for them. So telling them moderation in all things is just a wonderful way to continue to sell food to these people that they shouldn't be eating.
such a great point. I do have to say, if there is a justification for eating frosted mini weeks and wheats, it is the milk afterwards. I, <laughs> I remember that taste. Always, I, we always grew up on skim milk, so I remember that taste of skim milk, and like that was the best part for sure. So there, you're justified with the with the frosted <laughs> mini weeks. Oh, so what's your poison of choice if you're not a mini weeks guy? What is it? Oh man, well I I remember we were always too cheap. You know, Mormon family growing up, like oh yeah, too cheap oh dude, like the expensive stuff. So whatever came in the bag, you know, whatever whatever like, the Malto meal bag was. <laughs> Um, the the multi meal that was the knockoff of Lucky Charms, and I would just pick out all the all the um all the marshmallows. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, before we go, I do want to give you space for something I don't feel like you get to talk about and promote a lot, and that's Health Code. Um, I I really love your shakes, man. They, more than any other product, if I'm on the run. And not only do I want protein, but I want the fat the way you explained it, but I also want to feel really satiated. Man, those things hold me over for a long time. So could you talk about your product? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So this is, I'm very proud of it. Um, and just to make it really, really clear, I was, I, I'm founder of it, but I'm not currently intimately involved anymore. My brothers are really just running the show. Yeah, so that, that was just inspired by nature, really, in a way, which was this comment I made earlier that is, um, protein always comes with fat. And as much as I'm an advocate of, of protein, which I am, and let that be the drum that people hear me beat the loudest, you cannot get protein without fat. And so it was just a matter of acknowledging that in nature, very often, some of the most nutritious foods like an egg, you get a one-to-one -one balance of protein to fat. And that was really the foundation um, for, for Health Code. It was just try to make a better meal replacement shake. Um, but also, let me just direct people. Um, a lot of what I'm doing nowadays is leaning into the education. And so I'll direct anyone. You mentioned my social media channels, which is great, but you can find everything. I'm trying to create like one common source. And everything that I'm doing is at insuliniq.com. Just really focusing, especially on the education and opportunities for people to learn more. Insuliniq.com. You can find everything that is Ben Bickman right there. That's excellent. Well, last question. Where do you want people to go to find you? We'll link Insulin IQ, but one last time, Insulin IQ, and also um, any other places you want to send people? Yeah. Um, no, that's it. Let's keep it simple. In, find me at InsulinIQ.com. Everything is there. My book, my upcoming book, um, any talks I'm giving, a lot of even social media posts we're, we're kind of compiling there. That's a great source. Excellent. We will link that in the notes. Like I said in the beginning, it is beyond a huge honor to host you. You went to school, you got your tenure, you were able to support your family, and it could have that could have been enough. That could have stopped there. But you have chosen to continue to share this message with bums like me out there that <laughs> really, really appreciate it. So just I, I adore your work. Such an honor to host you on the show. Thank you so very much for making the time. We really appreciate you. Oh, my pleasure. True. That's very kind of you, truly. Um, when, when you think you have something important to say, there's nothing more gratifying than having people who listen. So I appreciate it. Well, keep saying it. We really appreciate it, man. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio.